everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. And today I have a guest sitting in for Cole. Cole couldn't be with us today. So I got my buddy Kyle Fisher, P4, calling in today. He's going to help me out with a pretty cool topic. Kyle, what's up, man? Hello. How's it going? Very good. Very good. We've been talking about doing this for what, 17 months now? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It's been a while, but we're here and we're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Um, thanks for taking the time to do this. I know you're on rotations and stuff right now, so it's cool to have you here. And um, which, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you go to school, what your plans are right after graduation. So of course, so I'm a P4 currently right now at Texas A&M Ron Hale College of Pharmacy. That is located in Kingsville, Texas. For those that are not familiar with Texas, it's pretty much south, of, south, south, south Texas. And currently on my appies right now, I am um, just finished my infectious disease elective, and I just started a community rotation this past week. So it's been fun, and currently I am prepping, getting all my PGY-1 applications ready because I hope to... Uh, match to a PGY-1, and then after that, if all goes well, hopefully match to a PGY-2 in cardiology or critical care, which are my two areas of interest currently. Nice. Um, but other than that, uh, that's pretty much where I'm at right now and what's going on. What, what are you doing for community? So right now, I'm at so I'm at a Baylor Scott and White hospital, and they have it's kind of a weird system. They have like an outpatient retail setting, so it's not like a big chain CVS, Walmart type of deal, but it's just kind of like their own little outpatient uh, community setting. So that's where I'm at right now. That's cool. Yeah, I was wondering. That's a big switch from going infectious disease to community. That's kind of a big, a big transition. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely say they're not the same thing. <laughs> Uh, so critical care is what you're thinking um, long term? Critical care or cardiology. I really fell in the G and then the unit my second year of pharmacy school. So that's kind of where I like I found like my passion for both cardiology and critical care. So we'll see. That's cool. Have you have you heard any of the podcasts that we've done with Brian Gilbert? Oh yeah, Brian. Brian's awesome. Um, I, I follow him on Twitter as well. He's commented on some of my uh, infographics I've made, and uh, he he is an awesome critical care slash ED specialist. Uh, uh, he always tweets, and I learn a lot from him. And you can podcast you, with him was awesome. You gonna go do residency with him by any chance? Would that would that be something that would interest you? That PGY two I over there in Kansas, um, it's definitely on my list. Of, I, it all it all like depends on me. I need to master a PGY one first, but hopefully it all goes well. And then if uh, critical care is still there for me after my PGY one, definitely I would love to learn and be mentored by Brian. He's he's a phenomenal guy. Yeah, I mean, almost, he's so phenomenal. We could almost look past the fact that you have to go to Kansas for a year. Because let's be let's be real. <laughs> let's call that what it is. <laughs> No, um, yeah, Brian's awesome. He's super smart too. Um, it, he actually uh, has had a couple people that were originally listed. That's where they heard about him was on the podcast and stuff, and then kind of started, like you said, following him on Twitter and whatnot, and ended up going and working with him in residency after that. So it's been, it's pretty cool. He's uh, definitely got a little bit of a critical care following out there. It's pretty awesome. So we'll definitely have to put in a good word for you. See what you can do. Pull some strings. This <laughs> is something. <laughs> But um, to, so you mentioned the infographics stuff that he was commenting on. Tell, tell, I, I've talked to about this a little bit um, and on Instagram and whatnot, but tell everybody a little bit about that because that's how you and I first started chit-chatting um, was looking at your infographics. So give us a little background on that. Oh, yeah, of course. So infographics, I mean, I don't consider myself a very artistic or I guess visually appealing a graphic kind of maker, if you would like to say. And around January of this year, actually, or December 2019, uh, it really started from these two twins on Twitter that I started following. They're the Barlow uh, twi uh, twins. It's Ashley and Brooke Barlow. Mm -hmm. One, uh, Brooke's a PGY2 uh, critical care resident at UK. And Ashley, I believe she's a PGY2 oncology resident at MD Anderson in Houston. And I just saw all these amazing infographics they started making and they even made an infographic on how to make an infographic. And I was like, you know what, like, let me try and give this a shot because at my school, a lot of underclassmen, and a lot of current classmates uh, were always asking you like, oh man, I wish I had like a quick, concise little one pager on certain disease states, almost like a topic discussion, but like quickly and concise. So I was like, okay, let me get, let me see what I can do. And I just started 
getting used to it. I started getting more practice with them and I just kind of fell in love with doing these infographics and they really help not only me as a P3 doing them uh, while I'm looking at them in rotation right now, but many other P2, P2s and P1s. Just the other day, I had a P2 like at our pharmacy school at Texas A&M, we have this like rounds class, which you're like paired up in groups of four and you do like a patient case. And I believe it was on GERD. And they, I got like a random text when I was in rotation, like, oh, um, oh my gosh, your infographic saved our group's, your group's butt and it helped us uh, complete this patient case. And they're like, I hope you don't mind us using it. I'm like, no, of course. Like, that's why I post them. Like, they're there for you. Share them, re- uh, like, with your friends. Share them to your family if you want to. <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's just been a great experience. And honestly, I just have to like, give a shout out and thanks to Ashley and Brooke Barlow because they were the ones, even though I had never actually met them, in person they were the ones that kind of got me interested into this whole process and they are very influential on the twitter or x community for those that are on uh twitter and then of course even talking to you uh i got started making my professional instagram and where i post these uh infographics as well and it's just being on twitter and instagram posting these infographics i think it's just an awesome way to network and just to reach out to other healthcare professionals and interact and just even converse about certain disease days or just life in general so it's been a great experience this last uh six seven months that i've been doing it and i i am so happy that I, I joined the twitter rx community and then instagram for the professional side as well yeah that's something that people are i think sick of me talking about because like I always and I bring it up to every single rotation student that I have because I think it's one of those things that's super super important for especially in your fourth year. Everybody's CV I feel like is you know, everybody does the same cliche. You know, you're a part of these groups, you volunteer at these places. You know, you do this, you do that, you put this in your, you do these shadowing experiences, and all that stuff is important. But it's one of those things that you know, I, one if if it's if you're not truly passionate about that stuff, it comes. It, people sometimes can see through that and you see it's kind of fake and you're just doing it because that's what you're supposed to do. And then two, it doesn't really set you apart from anybody anymore. Now everybody does that stuff. So like when I see st- the students, like the, the twins you were talking about, the Barlow twins, I've followed them since they were PGY, um, or not PGY, when, since they were fourth years. And so now I see them kind of moving through. It's awesome. So they have, you know, like I used to, they have great content and they're consistent as well. Everybody makes the excuse, I'm too busy. Well, I'm pretty sure they're pretty busy with residency and they're still putting out stuff. And, oh, I bet. And it's one of those things. And then now I just need Brian to hook you up with a residency so that I can really like <laughs> really solidify my theory here. Cause it'd be like you, you join Twitter and next thing you know, you got, you got your foot in the door with a residency in critical care. Um, that'll, that'll complete my hypothesis. But, um, it's one of those things that I'm, I'm such a big believer in that because like you said, it's such an easy way of networking. And yet the only one you ever hear the school talking about is going to like, events like you know conferences and things which is important it's great you know definitely do those things but you can also do stuff like this from you know your couch and it's an opportunity that i think a lot of students are not taking advantage of so it's awesome that you're putting the content out there and especially if you have to make it anyway i see these people making these crazy study guides that i could never in a million years come up with and i'm like what do you do with this when you're done like i either you know it goes in a bookshelf and or it goes in the trash I'm like that trash. That's a terrible place for it. So you know, I'm glad that you're doing it, man. That's awesome. I hope uh, I need you know more people to hear other people besides me talk about it because I think for me it's like yeah, easy to say Instagram, dude. That's all you like to do, <laughs> you weirdo. Um, so I, I like to have stories like yours where it shows you know students actually getting to do all this different stuff because they took the initiative and thought outside of the box. It's super super important. And yeah, just one thing to add about that. Uh, to any students listening, it doesn't matter if you're a pharmacy student, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, medical student, whatever the case may be, uh, join the Twitter community uh, and the professional Instagram community. And you don't you don't have to be, join and be like, oh, now I have to make infographics. No, like you can join and just follow others and learn about content. I mean, I'm not kidding when, so each rotation I have to do a journal club. I mean, I think like 90% of my journal clubs have, I've gotten from like someone tweeting a new article Mm -hmm. on Twitter or someone uh, posting a new article on Instagram. And it's just like the information is so fast uh, nowadays on social media. So it's a great way just to just get, get information, learn. And like we said, network. So 
for anyone out there listening, I really urge you guys to join because it's a, I'm sure if you talk to any of us, like it's been an awesome experience. And for me, a fairly new uh, person on Twitter and uh, Instagram, I don't regret it. And I urge everyone to join and be a part of this Twi- Twitter RX community that we call it and on Instagram as well. Absolutely, man. That's good stuff. So, and we'll make sure we link, you know, your Instagram page and all that good stuff. So, and then you and I have been talking about doing like a, a new, like a monthly newsletter through like my website members and stuff, and then putting one of your infographics with it and kind of, um, cross pollinating that way a little bit. <laughs> but, um, so, so from a actual content standpoint, what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about acute decompensated heart failure. What is that? <laughs> So let us see what acute decompensated heart failure is. So basically, it's like an exacerbation of heart failure. And it refers to like those patients with new or worsening signs or symptoms of heart failure. And it's just, man, it's a whole beast that another subset of heart failure. And a lot of times where we classically, what we remember from pharmacy school is that for steroid hemodynamic classification, where we remember like, oh, I remember those four little scatter, <laughs> those four plots. Uh, I kind of remember something like that. So we're going to get into it here pretty quickly, though. Yeah. So and the way I always think about it is usually it's someone, like you said, who's presenting with those worst um, signs and symptoms of heart failure, a lot of times happening from volume overload. Um, and then also it can happen, you know, from low cardiac output for whatever reason. Um, but basically it's something that we have to, in most cases, it's going to require medical intervention. Um, and a lot of times we have to, in, um, you know, admit these patients, um, treat them inpatient and then get them back, you know, on their feet. And then we kind of release them, uh, back to an outpatient setting on the correct meds is also another important thing that we'll touch on towards the end. But, um, you know, we're, we're just basically trying to like stabilize the patient, get them back to baseline and then are as close as we can and then go from there. But, um, you know, as, as far as kind of looking at some of the, you mentioned like the, um, the, the graph where you can see like the quadrants and things like that. It's a very simple way of, of kind of looking at it. Um, but it, I think it's also an effective way of looking at it. So if you think about, and I'll, we should put, I'll post something about this so people can see, but, um, when we think about, um, the way it's kind of laid out, we're thinking cardiac output on the Y axis and then pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or, or PCWP on the, um, X axis. And the kind of like the, the way that kind of cross the, the middle point for each of those, I think 2.2 for a cardiac output or cardiac index is how it's also referred to. Um, so 2.2 is kind of like the middle of that Y axis. And then 18, um, is the middle wave between pulmonary capillary wedge pressure on the X axis. And that's when it makes this quadrant of basically the, the top left quadrant, they refer to it as warm and dry. Um, the bottom left quadrant is cold and dry. The top right quadrant is warm and wet. And then the bottom and, uh, the, the worst case scenario, um, bottom right is going to be cold and wet. And so we'll talk about what that means. Um, but if you haven't kind of, if you're not familiar with that kind of layout, um, make sure that you, you know, take a look and I'll post, like I said, I'll post it on, um, you know, the Instagram or something. And I'm sure Kyle, you have some stuff too, but, uh, take a look at that. Cause it's, that's a very kind of quick cheat sheet. If you ever start to forget about where you need to go therapy wise. Um, it's so- Sorry, go ahead. No, I said I totally agree. And, and usually your patients are going to fall into one of those subsets. And I'll, depending on what subset they are in, will kind of dictate how to proceed with the treatment. And, you know, it's, the thing is, too, is what's causing this issue? Like if a person has heart failure, obviously, you know, we're, we're monitoring their weight and hopefully we have them on all the evidence based medications that they need to be on to control their ejection fraction. But some things that can kind of precipitate this, you know, acute decompensation, there's a whole bunch of different things that could potentially, you know, happen. Big one, non-compliance of medications. You can have them on, on paper on all the right medications, but if they're not taking them. You know, that's a whole different thing. And that's one thing that I think can happen with, uh, that or can help with pharmacists, um, their pharmacists can help with rather, is the adherence piece of it. You know, you got a physician who's seeing 25 patients a day, you know, they have such little time to like, they don't have time to sit there and be like, are you really taking the medicine? Come on, you know, and that's where we can kind of jump in and help because, you know, we have a little bit more time to, in most cases, um, to kind of sit with the patient, do a little bit more digging. 
build that trust. And then hopefully, you know, if there is some issues with compliance, you know, find out why, um, and then see what we can do to kind of address it. But that can be one big thing. Dietary, you know, indiscretion where we have patients eating a lot, you know, high salty foods, um, volume overload, um, patients that maybe they're on the right uh, medications, but you haven't kind of titrated them up to the target doses. So if you've seen our heart failure um, podcast or you do the Patreon lectures or anything, we talk about the target doses of the evidence-based medicine. So pushing those ACE inhibitors um, or ARBs uh, or the ARNI to the, the goal dose, the beta blockers to the goal dose, and not just, okay, they're stable, good to go. You know, But making sure that we, over time, are still controlling that hypertension because um, that's obviously going to be a risk factor. And then other things, you know, infection can lead to it. You know, certain uh, patient develops AFib. Uh, there can be, you know, issues where certain medications, so NSAIDs, um, you know, if a patient was on a, a TZD like pioglitazone for their diabetes, um, things like certain steroids, TNF-alpha inhibitors are based. So we did an episode on rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Um, you know, that's biologics and that's TNF-alpha inhibitors. A lot of times it's first line when you start going to biologics for rheumatoid arthritis. Well, you know, one of the things is a person has heart failure. We try to stick with the, the DMARDs or non-TNF-alpha biologic because that's an issue. Um, co- cocaine and amphetamines, if you have patients that are kind of abusing those types of meds, there's l- so many different things that can actually lead to this. So, you know, obviously it's important to kind of figure out if possible, what did lead to it so that we can hopefully treat that underlying condition so that it doesn't happen again, as well as making sure that the patient's on the correct medications and gets the right treatment after the fact. Yeah, I totally agree. And just to add on some of the medications that may precipitate or exacerbate the heart failure, one thing that we need to just be uh, mindful is that those non-DHP calcium channel blockers, like your detilazem and verapamil, uh, they have negative inotropic effects, which may lead to the exacerbation of heart failure, as well as kind of uh, intra- intraconazole as well. And then, of course, some of the over the counters I think you mentioned, one is um, some glucocorticoids that may promote sodium and water retention as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as far as kind of figuring out where we need to go with treatment with these patients, we talked about the subsets in those four quadrants. Um, the, you know, if a patient falls into subset one, which is that, um, you know, the top upper left quadrant, we're thinking that's they kind of list, list that as like a normal patient. So a lot of times those patients don't even necessarily need therapy. So they maybe present with heart failure, but they don't necessarily need additional treatment in inpatient. It's kind of getting them back on the right meds and then have them on their way. Now, subset two, where you go, um, your your wedge pressure is above eighteen, but your in your cardiac out, your cardiac index or cardiac output is above two point two. So that that top right quadrant is considered pulmonary congestion. So that's more you're dealing with the congestion piece of it. If the if the cardiac index is below two point two and that wedge pressure is below eighteen, so that left bottom quadrant, that's more of a hypoperfusion situation. So that's more, you have to be thinking along those lines. And then if it's subset four, so the wedge pressure is above 18, but the cardiac index is still low, that's where you're dealing with both pulmonary congestion and the hypoperfusion. And so it becomes a little bit more of a severe situation. That's obviously the one that has the worst prognosis and all that stuff. So, um, you know, like I said, the the first subset, that's the one we we hope for, because then we're not really having to do additional pharmacotherapy other than getting them on the right correct things and getting ready for for discharge yeah, but, i totally agree with the subset one you basically were just trying to, like you said probably the most favorable subset to be in if you have an acute decompensation and you're just basically trying to maximize their evidence-based oral medications and continue the appropriate monitoring absolutely so i guess we can start with uh subset two warm and wet um so again cardiac index above 2.2 and then that wedge pressure above 18. So it's going to be um, the pulmonary congestion that we're mostly dealing with. It's first line, diuretics. You know, um, and, um, loops all day. <laughs> That's you know, obviously the, the diuretic of choice when it comes to fluid retention. Um, so we got our furosemide, our bunetanide, and torsemide um, are going to be our main options there. Uh, most of the time, furosemide or bumin and I, I feel like is the two that they kind of go with. Um, typically we're going to do IV to kind of hopefully get this, um, you know, to, to happen quickly and get their fluid and, um, the, their, get their volume down so they can, uh, hopefully get that, start getting their, um, congestion to, 
be eliminated so we can get their heart functioning normally again, get some of that stress off the heart. So as far as like loop goes, most of these patients uh, you know, are going to be on certain loop directs, at least PRN outpatient when they come in, especially if they've already been diagnosed initially with heart failure. And this is just a, an, another um, exacerbation. So we typically take their, you know, whatever their daily dose of a loop and we use it in, in uh, what they call furosemide equivalents. And so regardless of what medication they're on, outpatient so um, basically the way that i think about it is for for oral tablet um or oral doses rather 40 milligrams of furosemide equals 20 milligrams of torsamide equals one milligrams of bimetanide that's kind of like the one i have memorized and then also too this is obviously not going to apply to this particular situation because it's not going to be um an iv form i don't believe it has an iv form um but if a person has like a true like sulfa allergy. I'm talking like, and not just a, you know, sulfonamide allergy from like a Bactrim, but like a true sulfa allergy that they have hypersensitivity reaction to it. I've only personally seen this one time where a patient actually had like literally anaphylaxis that they had anything with sulfa in it. Um, in that case, because all the loop diuretics that we commonly think of have that sulfa moiety at their center of their structure. So um, in that case, if that happens, uh, we do have a, a fourth loop that we a lot of times don't think about called ethochronic acid. Um, and that's one that, you know, if you're 50 milligrams of ethochronic acid equals 40 milligrams of furosemide. So you can kind of lump that one in there too. But that's just a little little extra something, something. If, uh, if you have a patient like that, like I said, I've only seen that one time. It's more of those that textbook answer kind of thing, but it is something that, you know, you never know because that one time that you do run into it, it's going to be important. Um, and then the PO to IV ratio is typically, and there's some discrepancy about people disagree with this, but i still kind of consider like two, um, a two to one ratio from PO to IV with furosemide, but then the others are one to one. And at the clinic gas, I did double check myself. There's no IV version. So, um, one to one ratio, and then with furosemide, a two to one PO to IV ratio. So we're taking their normal dose, whatever their their normal daily dose is, and we're you know using either using that up to two point five times that daily dose um, in furosemide equivalents. So use that conversion chart, can um, change it over to whatever the page we have available on formulary, and give them that IV. You know, either it can be every eight to twelve hour intervals, or you can even do a continuous infusion. And basically, you're just kind of monitoring their their response to it, their kidney function, all that good stuff, to see how well it's working to hopefully diurese them down and get that, you know, get that function back. I totally agree. And just one thing to add, like we had said that on the guidelines recommend one to 2.5 times the total daily or loop diuretic and furosemide equivalent to be the starting dose. Uh, but one also thing to add in there is uh, in 2011, I believe there's like a dose trial that it was called. And what, although there was like no significant difference in the primary outcomes, which looked at like differences in patients' global assessment of symptoms or the change of renal function, they saw that the high dose strategy of furosemide, which they used at 2.5 times the home dose, had greater diuresis and more favorable outcomes in terms of like fluid loss, weight loss, and relief from dyspnea, as well as some um, fewer serious adverse events. So, at least from I'm from, and a lot of the cardiology pharmacists and docs that inpatient wise, they like do the 2.5. Uh, times the home dose. But again, we have that range of one to 2.5 times that the guidelines recommend that we can start the patient on. Yeah, absolutely. So then from there, you have to kind of figure out where you want to go. So if the patient has uh, improving symptoms, obviously kind of stay on course and um, just keep monitoring, make sure that their symptoms continue to improve. Um, and then also come up with a plan as far as transitioning to oral therapy from IV so you can get them ready for discharge and hopefully have them on their way. Now, if you get a little bit of improvement initially, but then that improvement sort of like stalls out and you're not, you don't see it continuing, that's when you can um, escalate the diuretic. So you can either increase the loop dose by as much as 50 to 100%. Um, and then there's also um, the option of adding a thiazide diuretic. And the one that is mainly used, I haven't really seen any other um, any other thiazides used except this one, but the one that's mainly used is metolazone. So that's one of those diuretics that are thiazides that you really never see other than this particular situation. And so if we think about it from like a mechanism standpoint, 
most of the thiazide diuretics are going to work in the distal convoluted tubule as far as like their electrolyte exchange and, you know, increasing that excretion of um, sodium and all that and, and getting rid of the water that way. But um, metolazone actually, and there's an article about this. I need to figure it out. So I, I can't remember the, um, the exact um, date it was published, but I need to find it so I can put it in the show notes. Um, but there's an article that actually showed that metolazone actually may have a little bit of uh, activity in the proximal convoluted tubule as well. And so it kind of makes sense that that one might be more effective because if you're blocking the reabsorption of sodium and some of those other electrolytes and the proximal convoluted tubule, you're shuttling more of those into the loop of Henle. So hopefully given more um, activity, you know, with, from the loop diuretic. So they have like this synergistic effect. The issue is definitely you could cause them to, you know, over diurese those patients and then that could be a whole other issue that you got to be careful with so careful careful monitoring and i've even seen sometimes where they'll give like one dose of the combo and then go back to the the loop um have you seen this at all in your rotations or anything yes sir i've seen i've seen just like they said i've seen providers give one dose and then i've seen it being coupled on there for that synergistic activity and just like one thing to know also like the preferred dose is that 2.5 to 5 milligrams but given 30 minutes before the loop diuretic is given that that is a super important point because if you give the if you give the um metolazone the same time which happens i feel like a lot that's one of the things that people will catch um metolazone at the same time as the loop you've completely defeated the purpose of increasing the activity of those electrolytes you know being shuttled exactly. in the loop of henley because you need the 30 minutes to absorb because the metolazone is, is a oral tablet give that first give about 30 minutes then iv that's awesome good that's a very good point and i didn't mention that way to save me kyle <laughs> no problem <laughs> so um the other thing is too you know if that still is not enough to you know one obviously you need to figure out what's what else may be going on and to dive a little deeper but you also can use what they call ultra filtration um, to remove the excess fluid if you're not responsive to the medication treatment. Um, that may be an option that they end up having to go with. All right. Um, as far as side effects, you know, one of those things to kind of think about, obviously we've touched on this a lot, um, but from a loop standpoint, you know, we're thinking about electrolyte um, wasting to some extent. Um Mostly we're going to be with like potassium. It's more so than, than sodium. Sodium is going to be a lot more uh, common with the thiazide. Um, but there's also a risk of increasing uric acid and, and uh, glucose. So um, there's less risk with loops, but then thiazides have a higher risk of that. So keeping track, especially when you're using the combo, you have to keep track of the, uh, the electrolyte imbalances as well as the uric acid and glucose because you also don't want to cause other issues while they're inpatient as well. So kind of just keeping track of the electrolytes. Um, uh, loops typically um, going to decrease calcium, whereas thiazides are going to increase it. So definitely make sure you're familiar with which way the electrolytes are going in or out um, when it comes to the different diuretics. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right. Um, anything else with the with those patients? So with subset two, I mean, like we said, the main thing is just going to be the diuresis. And although if diuresis doesn't work and the synergistic effect is still not working and ultrafiltration, somehow we can't get to it or we just doesn't work, then we can possibly add on some vasodilators that, uh, that do not respond to IV diuresis. And that's when the uh, vasodilators may be considered. And the vasodilator of choice most of the time is going to be the nitroglycerin uh, for that preload reduction. Yeah. So um, with the vasodilators too, I think it's important to kind of note that they haven't really, they don't really see like improved outcomes overall. Um, but there is some improvement in patients as far as like the dyspnea goes, so the actual symptoms. So as long as the patient does not have hypotension present, so no symptomatic hypotension, then if you give a vasodilator, once you've started the diuresis process, then you can um, see some improvement in that dyspnea, but it's not going to improve overall outcomes. So that's something you have to be really careful with, obviously, because um, if the patient does have any kind of hypo uh, tension, you definitely don't want to be giving um, a vasodilator and you know, nitroglycerin or anything like that because it's going to cause a whole new slew of problems. 
Yes, sir. That would definitely not be a good thing. It's not not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything else with with those? No. Besides nitroglycerin, I, like you said, I mean, we can also talk about a little bit of nitroprusside. That'll be if the patient, for whatever reason, is if they have hypotension or they're totally contraindicated to nitroglycerin, nitroprusside could be the, I guess, the second line vasodilator if you want to call it like that. Uh, but we just got to keep in mind that like patients with hepatic impairment, they're at increased risk for developing cyanide toxicity and patients with renal impairment, they're at increased risk of developing the thiocyanide toxicity with this natural parasite. Yep. Um, there was also a third one that used to be in the market. Um, Nisuretide, I think is, how, is what it was, but they've, yes. they've removed that from the market. There was a bunch of different issues with it and stuff. So it's no longer available, at least in the U S it may be available other places, but um, yeah, not one that we are using anymore. All right. So subset three and go on. So, um, subset three, uh, we're typically thinking, um, that's what I said was the cold and dry is what they refer to it as. So cardiac index is going to be less than 2.2 and that wedge pressure is going to be less than 18. So that lower left quadrant is what we're thinking. So cold and dry, um, you know, as far as treatment goes, typically we're thinking IV fluids is what we're starting with. Um, and, you know, we want to basically get them um, rehydrated if, they're, if they are having um, low perfusion initially. Um, and then uh, if hypovolemia, you know, exists, so if they have like orthostatic hypotension um, and, you know, especially if, um, you know, we have to be cautious with it, but we still typically will start with, with fluids. Um, if the wedge pressure is below 15, then the IV fluids should be cautiously administered, um, to provide that optimal left ventricular filling pressure, um, which is typically going to be 15 to 18 when it comes to the wedge pressure, um, which is going to then improve that cardiac index. I totally agree. One thing to add to that is that if, for whatever reason, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is actually uh, a little bit above the 15 to 18 range. The, the MAP, which is the mean arterial pressure and the systolic blood pressure should always dictate the treatment and how, how much fluid you're going to give. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, once, you, once you have the patient, um, you get into some of that fluid back in their system, um, then if the cardiac index is still low, um, even once you've kind of restored that optimal left ventricular filling pressure, um, then you can potentially cautiously, um, consider like a, a positive inotropic agent. So like, um, the butamine or milrinone or one of those, but it's definitely going to be, you know, reserved for patients that are, or, I mean, relatively not doing well. I mean, they're going to have severely low cardiac output, um, and they're, you know, as well as not candidates, because the other option would be a um, vasodilator as well. Um, and so they're not a candidate for that. Um, they could use a um, cardiac, uh, or excuse me, inotrope, positive inotrope. Um, but again, this is typically going to be saved for someone who is um, really in a bad spot. And sometimes we, we even use it as kind of like a quote-unquote bridge therapy um, in these patients because we're basically waiting for them to have, um, you know, the... Uh, a procedure done, even a cardiac transplant, uh, to kind of like kind of stabilize them until they can have that. But it's definitely not something that is, you know, every single person that's in this subset is just getting a, a uh, inotrope. I agree. And then just one thing to add. So like we're not talking about the subset three, but for this one, the IV vasodilator of choice, if need be, it will be the nitroprusside, And that's because of that the nitroprusside does have that arterial vasodilation property, whereas in subset two, the vasodilator of choice is going to be your nitroglycerin. Awesome, and and you can totally add more than one thing if you want, man. Don't feel like uh, <laughs> don't feel like it can only be one thing. You're, you're putting in some great insight. I like that. Okay. Um, the other thing is too, and I th and the guidelines talk about if you know patients that are on like long term continuous inotropic support. Um, sometimes we consider that in patients who you know, are more, we're more thinking like palliative care and we're basically just trying to control symptoms. Um, I know when I was in school, I ended up doing a, um, which 
it was a rough rotation just for the boringness of it, but we did a rotation <laughs> um, of home infusion and um, that's definitely not my forte. Very important stuff, but not my, not my area. And, um, but I, we were making like a uh, mill renowned, um, IV still like send home with patients. And oh, wow. yeah, it was for those, those types of situations where really, unless the patients maybe the patient's not a candidate for, um, a transplant or something, and then, you know, they're not doing well. So we basically are using it as like palliative, um, therapy, symptom relief. So yeah, just very cautious. Definitely. Um, not something we just throw around lightly. I agree. All right. What do you want? What should we talk about with cold and wet? So cold and wet, that's your subset four. And basically these patients have inadequate perfusion despite being overloaded with fluid. Their cardiac index is decreased and their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is elevated. And these are your patients that have the highest mortality risk. And a lot of the times you'll see them kind of go into cardiogenic shock some uh, in this cold and wet subset four. And basically here, the treatment goal for these patients, we were trying just to alleviate the signs and symptoms of con congestion and hypoperfusion by increasing the cardiac index above the 2.2 and reducing the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to around the 15 to 18 range while also maintaining adequate uh, MAP. Yes. Um, and then also if the patient did have um, hypotension or if their uh, menotinal pressures were low, um, you know, then vasodilators, which is another potential option in certain issues uh, or certain situations is going to be avoided in those patients. So significant hypotension, low MAPs, we're definitely avoiding vasodilators. Um, and then the other thing is too, in certain situations, we can use inotropes as well, but the, there is vasodilating properties of those, um, which is going to potentially um, uh, compromise those MAPs. And so there are cases where you may end up seeing a patient who's uh, on combined inotrope and vasopressor therapy. So like dibutamine plus norepinephrine um, is the example that I typically think of. Um, and that's basically there to achieve adequate end organ perfusion um, in these patients. Um, anything else with that? I mean, I know it's a, a gross o <laughs> overview, but, um, I know you got, you got some, something to add, I'm sure. Anything? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For that subset four, I mean, it's kind of your sickest of the sick and here, one thing to consider, although this is going to be not really the focus of the subset four, but mechanical support was like intra-aortic balloon pumps, ventricular assist devices, or extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. It may be useful in patients with cardiogenic shock. And like how we talked a little bit earlier, it can serve as like that bridge to transplant or other kind of procedures as well. Yeah, good stuff. So the other thing is um, that I feel like is often not talked about is when the patient comes in, I shouldn't say not talked about, but you know, something we don't always consider if you're not working in this space. Um, you know, the patient, when they are admitted to the, to the hospital, a lot of times, regardless of what the disease state is, a lot of times some of their home meds are held until they can kind of get them stabilized for whatever's causing the issue. And then they're released. You know, we see that with patients who are um, dealing with like DKA, you know, diabetics that have DKA, um, they'll, they'll hold some of their home meds and then hopefully um, restart them on the way out. So, for a while, it was kind of common practice to, uh, when the patient would come in the hospital, to stop a beta blocker. Because ideally, patient comes in with half ref, they've been on ACE ARB or, or ARNI, and then um, they've been in a beta blocker, and then maybe spironolactone after that. But the beta blocker, because that can, you know, potentially um, decrease like your cardiac output, cardiac index, you know, that's one of the concerns is like, should we stop that while we stabilize the patient and then kind of go from there? And so they, they didn't really know, like, you know, it, it seems obviously right from a logical thinking standpoint, but what does it look like actually clinically? They had to do some, some studies to kind of figure out what was going on. Um, but they did a study called Optimize HF, um, which is where they continued the beta blockers in some patients and the other group had their beta blockers stopped. Um, and basically the end result was that continuing the beta blocker had um, led to a shorter hospital stay and a significantly lower post-discharge mortality. And part of that just could be just because you are getting, when sometimes when things are stopped in the hospital, they're not always restarted. 
And, you know, we see that a lot with, um, I, I saw that just this week with a couple of my patients that are dealing with hypertension and diabetes. When they were, when they got back on the uh, in the outpatient setting, they were like, well, the hospital stopped it in the hospital. They never told me to start, you know, taking it again. So I just didn't. And then they come see us in the clinic a few weeks later and their blood pressure's through the roof, their blood, their blood sugar's out of control again. <laughs> and so it's important to kind of, you know, make sure they get on the right stuff. So that study may have just kind of had those results because those patients, especially the post-discharge mortality piece, because they are, they're getting back on the correct meds. Um, they also did a study called Be Convinced, um, where they, again, stopped uh, either continued beta blockers or stopped um, for three days. Uh, the, and they didn't stop multi They stopped for the beta blocker for three days and then restarted them. And in that case, they didn't find any difference um, in dyspnea or general well-being, but um, continuing had a higher rate of beta blocker therapy at three-month follow-up. So just stopping them for three days and then restarting. Um, even in that case, had it showed a higher um, level of adherence after the fact. So it kind of echoes, hopefully, the long-term effects of what we'd see with optimized HF, but also you know, just shows that that's maybe the cause of why we see that, that mortality benefit. I totally agree. And then just also one thing, to as pharmacists, that we have this opportunity to counsel, whether we're doing discharge counseling in the AMCARE clinic or even in a community setting, and we know these patients uh, just got discharged from the hospital after an acute decompensation, it's really like the lifestyle modifications and kind of like what certain over-the-counter medications to avoid. And so that's, that's what goes back to like your NSAIDs, your Sudafed, um, talk about men and women to limiting alcohol for men less than two drinks a day for women is one drink or less a day um, fluid intake to be mindful of it I know it's hard for I mean if someone told me to to make sure my fluid is less than two liters a day or I mean I that's that's hard but it's Gonna one thing that yeah be fighting especially a sodium <laughs> restriction less than two grams a day um, I don't say that. I don't think that's super easy to do, but I mean, it's important for us to at least counsel and to let them know that if we don't follow these recommendations, we may have another exacerbation. And for the cause uh, these. That last, the last two words, I think you said kind of broke up a little bit, but. Um, so, yeah, I think that's perfect as far as, like, keeping track and, like, making sure that they make those lifestyle modifications. I don't know if you said it or not, too, but the daily weight checks to see if they're retaining water, also an important thing. And if they're not, let very them, important. letting their cardiologist know. But um, the the other thing we'll mention, too, is uh, I know for a while they were looking at, because um, we know in Tresto, the Secubitrol, Valsard, and the Arnie um, is definitely uh, very effective, decreases mortality, decreases hospitalizations compared to an allopril or, you know, an ACE inhibitor um, in patients with HEFREF. But what about when do we start that? You know, how, how when is that going to, you know, uh, be effective? Um, and so they did, they did do a study called Pioneer HF. Um, and they basically are looking at Entresto um, in patients hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure um, that also had a um, reduced ejection fraction and basically starting that, you know, in the hospital type situation so that they were in their discharge beyond it. Um, the primary outcome they were looking at was the time average proportional change in the NT pro BMP. So remember with um, being on Secubitrol and Valsartan, um, you typically would want to draw an NT pro BMP instead of a, just a plain BMP uh, because um, basically Secubitrol is blocking naproliacin. And naproliacin is one of the um, enzymes that uh, is involved with uh, BNP breakdown. So you're going to most likely have an elevated BNP, even if your heart failure is controlled, um, if the person's on interest. That's not an accurate marker, um, at least in, you know, in theory. And so uh, the pro-BNP is not affected by that. And so that's the one you want to measure because that'll be a true indication of uh, their control. So they were looking at the change in that from baseline through weeks four and eight. Um, and so Entresto, they said was, um, superior to an allopril for some of the hot, like the primary stuff, but as far as the, um, rehospitalization, um, they saw a, uh, eight, 80%, eight, percent versus 13.8%. Um, so in, in Tresto versus an allopril, there was no difference in all cause mortality though. So the other thing is, you know, it may, it may be helpful as far as 
decreasing the actual, you know, numerical value of the NT pro BMP, but if that doesn't lead to a decrease in mortality, you know, that's where eh, it's really that effective. Um, so some people would still say yes, uh, but there's hasn't been like a cost benefit analysis because Entresto is a lot, a lot more expensive than an ACE inhibitor. So that's the other piece of it. And, and typically speaking to the patients have to be established on an ACE inhibitor coming in um, the hospital because you are supposed to be on a established on an ACE to make sure you can tolerate it before you switch to a uh, the Arnie. So yeah, check it out, Pioneer HF. Um, not quite as you know exciting as we were hoping it would be, but it is uh, still some some data that's out there. What else, man? What did we miss? I think just one key thing to add on, I think we might have missed it in the beginning, is just always the clinical assessment early on is just kind of the key thing to, to for, I guess, diagnosing this uh, acute decompensation heart failure. And usually, like, the cardinal symptoms of acute decompensated heart failure, we're going to see, of course, our dyspnea, our fatigue, and fluid retention. And the doc, you may hear the doc say, like, uh, they may have an S3 gallop or they have some jugular venous distension. And that's kind of like the mainstay or like cardinal symptoms for that this patient is presenting with some type of congestion and possible acute acute decompensation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, just you'll hit, you'll, you can have some patients that have uh, obviously the rapid weight gain, like we talked about as well, which is I think a good thing that to mention to patients. Just if you see them on, especially as needed, you know, loops or, or daily loops, you know that they're probably taking in that case you see my all the right meds even if you're in a you know working in a retail pharmacy bring that up because if they do start having that rapid weight gain it's something that you know could be the early signs of an exacerbation and then before those other things set in so you can catch it early before the dyspnea and all that stuff sets in and all the congestion starts happening that would be ideal so quick quick counseling point that doesn't take up a lot of time definitely it's super important though yes sir Good stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming on and helping me do the review of this thing. No problem. Anytime. It was fun. It was fun being on here and talking about this topic. That I've yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, the uh, as far as like your like Instagram page and whatnot, where can people find you? So for Instagram, it's going to be K G Fisher, and how you spell Fisher is F I S C H. E R and then X. That'll be the Instagram KG Fisher RX. And then for Twitter, it's just K Fisher underscore 10. Okay. She's trying to spell Fisher the different way than it normally is. Way to get fancy. I, I know. I just, I don't know what to tell you. I was born and I was like, Fisher. <laughs> I guess with a C in it. I guess so. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. We like to, we like to spell things crazy when it comes to names, but it's all good. <laughs> it looks cooler than regular Fishers. So I'll give you that. Right. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. Well, um, I'll make sure I include your, uh, your Instagram and Twitter handles in the show notes. And then, you know, we'll definitely have you on again in the future. Um, we'll definitely, uh, to help get your infographics out there too. Because if you guys haven't seen his infographic stuff, super helpful. Um, he's he definitely had a lot of people that have used that during like topic discussions and journal clubs. And he's had, he's, he's, he's going to be too humble to admit this, but he's had, uh, uh, people that have reached out to him after the fact and been like, yo, <laughs> your infographics saved my butt on rounds. And, uh, so <laughs> definitely a good, uh, good thing to have. And then he's nice enough to do them for free. So yeah, take advantage of that. Because I think a lot of people would be putting that upcharge in there for those. So <laughs> Kyle's nice <laughs> no. enough to do it for free. No, you're too kind. But no, yeah, stay tuned. This week, I think I have a infective endocarditis infographic coming out probably on Sunday. And on my Instagram page, I just released an acute ischemic stroke infographic uh, maybe a few hours ago. For uh, I guess today we're recording this on Wednesday, November 18th. And but hopefully I can get an acute decompensated heart failure that can mirror this podcast and it'll be good good stuff. So if you guys want some cool infographics, go follow my page. And of course, if you have any questions about you know making infographics, joining uh, the Twitter community or Instagram, how do you get started? Uh, I'm sure you can reach out to either Mike or myself, and we'll be more than happy to uh, steer you on the right path. Absolutely. And now, like I said earlier, we just need Brian to step up, 
you know, get off his behind, <laughs> get my man a residency so that I can have a video clip of this later on when we announce his residency as a critical care pharmacist. I can be like, yo, I told you this back in 2020 that it was going to happen. <laughs> so Brian, let's go do something about it. But no, all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you, man, for being here. Um, if you guys have any questions, obviously I'll have Kyle's information in the show notes. And then if you know you guys have any questions or anything for me, comments, um, my email will be in there as well. Um, you can reach um, Cole or me at any of the social media platforms. Um, Instagram is obviously where we hang out with the most probably, but anything that suits your fancy, we will be there. And then um, if you want to text us directly, you can text 415-943-6116. And I'll get back to you on that as soon as I can. Um, also, too, if you know, for those of you who have joined the uh, the Patreon page, thank you so much for the support there. Um, I hope those lectures and whatnot are are helpful. Um, but basically, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's Patreon is uh, three dollars a month to join, and you get access to all the lectures. So I post my like my lectures that I give my PA students. So it's a lot more of a actual lecture style. I know some of you hate when me and Cole go off on these random tangents and stuff and this on the podcast, but, um, the lectures are actually more, a little bit more, well, I shouldn't say they're not completely professional, but they're more, I, I still joke around my students and stuff too. So, um, but I also include all my slide sets and things like that as well. So you get access to all that. And, um, I, from at least word on the street is they've been pretty helpful to people. So those of you who've already seen it, definitely appreciate the the support there. Um, check it out if you haven't. And then, you know, like I said, I've said before, if you, if you just absolutely $3 a month is out of the question, you just, you're li literally living on pennies, hit me up. We can, we'll, I'll figure something out. We'll give you access to it, you know, without charging. I'm not out here to try to make much money on it. We use the money just to reinvest back in the show. So thank you guys so much for the support and I will catch you next time. Have a good one. Good night, everybody.